Mr. Here we go. Balls, tell me what to do to make all my Lunker Lake dreams come true. Hello, everybody. Bob Loves the Bomb Boss. It must be Wednesday. Must be 6.30. We're going live. So, uh, y'all pull up a chair, buckle in. Let's have a little bit of fun. Tonight, I thought I would talk about one of our favorite topics that I don't think I've ever really talked about, which is uh, blue-green algae. So, why don't, we, uh, why don't we take a little time and do that? Let's talk a little bit about blue-green algae. And, and part of what's precipitated this conversation is I've had five, five today, five messages phone calls and emails and texts about blue-green algae so I want to talk a little bit about that and uh, share some conversation and answer your questions now I see John Funk and Jason Nipstat checking in we got 13 people looking so far so um, let me see here I want to be able to see who all is chiming in here Devin Thompson's on board Blair Ulring is on board good to see you guys and it's really, if I don't acknowledge you, it's just because something happened and I didn't see you come on. So, here's the deal. You guys know the drill. Hashtag Palm Boss Magazine in the comments section. Click like. Share this to your Facebook timeline and you are eligible for a drawing for a Palm Boss hat. There it is right there. Living color. Palm Boss hat. And a Palm Boss mug. Say it with me. Knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. We don't know how it knows, but it knows. Hey, 35 bucks a year, folks. Palm Boss Magazine. Comes out six times. $35. Cheaper than a Friday night date, and this lasts a year. When we get through here, we got uh, grandkids here. Going to go catch up with them and have a late supper. Uh, we spent a little time at the lake today, Lake Granbury, which is just up the road. So that was pretty fun. But I know we're going to spend more than 35 bucks for supper night. Hey, $35. This is the, the newest one, hot out on the presses, hitting people's mailboxes right now. Let's see, we got Chris Arthur, Billy Bates, Shannon Olson, Robert McDonald. We got folks from all over the nation. McDonald's checking in from New Jersey. Wyatt Cunningham's checking in from uh, probably in Denver, Colorado. John Henry from Arkansas. Let's see what else we got here. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, blue-green algae. Uh, today was just uh, just an anomaly for messages. I get a bunch of questions. There's Jeremy Duckworth. He's one of them. Jeremy's one of the guys. Messaged me today. Sent me a picture that I thought it was just a, a, a bucket full of, of green vomit. Uh, he didn't really say that. But the picture that Jeremy sent me was pretty frightening. So I messaged him right back and said, Hey, you know what? Is that the way the whole look like? Now, Jeremy's got a six-acre lake. And Jeremy, since you're here... We're gonna uh, we're gonna kind of cover that. There's Lake Charles, Louisiana. Chris Arthur, Todd Austin from Phoenix, Arizona. Holy cow, we got people from all over the nation. That's great. Baton Rouge, Gary Elborn. So what's going on with Jeremy's Lake? He's got a six-acre lake in Illinois, and it had a heavy rain uh, run and with lots of runoff coming off of ag fields. So he had a lake that was pretty stable. The water was doing what it needed to do, had a good plankton bloom, but then when the rain comes, several things happen. It dilutes the bloom, it drops the temperature, and it flushes with fresh water, alters the chemistry, even if it's just a minute amount of chemistry. When that happens, whatever the bloom has been is going to kill some of it. And when it dies, whether it's blue-green algae, planktonic algae, or algae that we like, <coughs> it's going to kill it, and when that stuff dies, it flows to the surface. water. So uh, there's Fred Bingaman. Fred was at the Grand Old Opry the other night in Nashville, Tennessee. Got to watch the tribute to Whispering Bill Anderson. I got to see a little bit of that Saturday night. So glad Fred's checking in. So um, what's going on with Jeremy is is what can sure happen to you. Now here's I'm, I'm going to tell you how blue-green algae works and I'm going to try to make it entertaining. Wish me luck. Mark Dyer, good to see you. Doug Cusick, good to see you. Jimmy Mitchell, I finally have a giant copper nose pond. I've always dreamed about because of that MVP. Mountain Home, Texas. That's just up the road from Kerrville. Jimmy, glad you're on. I'm glad you're growing some big copper nose, too. So, what happens is when 
when you've got healthy water, healthy water is the medium to grow healthy plants, healthy animals, healthy plankton, healthy zooplankton. So as all that stuff works together, something comes in to disrupt it, like a heavy rain, a rapid temperature drop, an influx of nutrients, then it gets temporarily out of balance. And it can take out some of that harmony that's been going on so well for a good part of the summer. So what happened in Jeremy's and I, um, uh, oh gosh, Kyle McKean messaged me today as well and three other guys did. But what what's going on is, is the algae grows and then when something kills it, whether it's an algae side, you do it on purpose, or whether it's those factors I just mentioned, as it dies, it begins to decompose and it floats. And it looks like you've got green paint floating on the surface or bubbly mats of, uh, of yucky looking green muck floating on top of the water. Well, that's dead algae that was thriving and living in the water column just not that long ago. And then when it dies, as it breaks down, the cellular structure, cellular structure begins to collapse, gases form, and it floats. So it floats, then it blows with the wind, and it, and it ends up in big mats or big wads that looks like, looks like green paint or blue-green paint. The picture that uh, Kyle McKean sent me today, you could see chunks of filamentous algae with chunks of paraphyton, which was kind of black, about as big around as a silver dollar, uh, olive green brillo pad looking algae floating amongst some really almost bright blue, um, oh heck, what's Irish Spring, blue Irish Spring soap floating on top of the water in, in a film like paint. You know, so he has some blue green algae. Now, what happens to cause blue green algae is it's able to outcompete the existing microscopic algaes in your water and it gets its biggest advantage in the summer. Now, in order for blue green algae to thrive, it's got to have an imbalance between nitrogen and phosphorus. That's a big reason that uh, one of the big topics in today's lake management world is how do you extract phosphorus from the water. There's going to be a really cool article in the next issue of Pond Boss. Matt Rails got one in this issue of Pond Boss talking about extracting phosphorus from water. There's going to be another really good article in the next issue that's, that is worth the 35 bucks for a full year subscription if you've got blue-green algae. So the more you can understand that, the better you can deal with it. So it's an imbalance of nutrients, number one. So that's why a lot of uh, time, energy, and money is spent on trying to extract phosphorus from the water. In Ask the Boss, in, uh, I think it's this issue, let me look at it real quick. In the July-August, and we can send you the July-August if you want to subscribe. Let me look and make sure this is it. Yeah, there it is right there. Bob, I still have your book on raising tro on raising big bass. Uh, 180 acre lake here is confirmed blue-green algae. I serve as a volunteer. The cost of Fosloc came up. What do we need to do about bacteria? What's the best thing to do? The photo is a hot spot. So anyway, what what there are several ways to attack blue-green algae. Uh, I do a, a radio show about once a month with Ken Milam, the Great Outdoors, or the Sunday Sportsman on 1300 The Zone on Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings. And one of the big topics this time of year is blue-green algae because the city of Austin, Lake Austin, ends up with blue-green algae and they send a warning out so you don't take your dog down there to, to, to drink water that's got blue-green algae in it and it kills the dog. You know, so blue-green algae deserves some really careful thought, and you, ought, you ought to do think that you need to pay attention when you have it. Now, one of Kyle's questions to me today was, will, will it harm the cattle if they drink it? The minute volume of uh, blue-green algae I saw floating in his water, I can't imagine that that would hurt cattle. But if you've got any concerns at all, call your vet and talk to your vet about it. So he, he, can, he or she uh, can give you some good advice on what to do if you think you've got blue-green algae. Now, what causes it? Imbalance of nutrients, the right temperature, and once blue-green algae gets a foothold, it's going gonna, it's gonna to grow. And then what it does is it consumes nutrients, outcompetes the good algae, proliferates, rises to the surface, dominates the sunlight, changes the water chemistry, and creates its own environment. Now. I don't know if you knew that or not, but that's what that stuff does. Uh, I can remember 
one summer, I think it was probably 2014, they closed most of the west end of Lake Texoma, which is a 90,000 acre lake. Because they deemed the blue green algae too dense and unsafe for humans and animals. So I'm not going to sit here and, 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 and try to alarm anybody, but what I am going to tell you to do is pay attention to it. Now, what caused Jeremy's was that influx of fresh water, temperature dropped, blue green algae gained an advantage, started growing, and now some of that stuff is dying. You know, now it wouldn't surprise me if the blue green algae continues. Now, if it, one of the things I would do is check your visibility and check it two times a day. Check it at daylight. I don't care if you want to sleep late. Get up. Go out there at daylight. Get a Sechi disc. If you haven't bought a Sechi disc, make one or buy one. S E C C H I. If you care about your ponds as much as, well, I know you do, or you wouldn't be watching this show. So get a Sechi disc and go check the visibility. Now, here's the way you do that. You take the sechi disc and you lower it in the water slowly until it disappears. When you can't see it, just raise it up just enough where you can barely see it in the water. That's the visibility depth. That's going to help you decide whether or not you want to do something about whatever you've got, whether it's planktonic algae, blue-green algae, or the healthy algaes that we like. So if your visibility in July and August is something less than 18 inches, like 12, that's a pretty dense bloom. You want to talk to your pond pro and see if you need to do something about it because you don't want to have a fish kill because it's too dense. So now let me see here what we got going on here. I'm going to talk more about blue-green algae here in a minute and kind of give you some more ideas about it. Bill Russell, Mark Dyer, Jason Rothamel. Good to see him from Pennsylvania. Looking to build a two-tenths acre pond on a step, on a, I guess a, a a steep slope or a stepping slope. Uh, does CPRO sonar RTU control filamentous algae? I don't think it does. I think it's more on um, the way that that stuff works is the plants take it up through the root system and then it, it, it stops the plant's ability to photosynthesize. Or like coontail, it absorbs it through the water column and it stops the plants. It's typically for macrophytes or even duckweed, uh, even water meal. Uh, fluoridone is the active ingredient, and that stuff absorbs into the plant, stops the plant's ability to photosynthesize, which basically starves it to death. So it's not a contact killer like herbicides are, but it's a long, you know, 60 to 90 day process before the plant can starve itself out. Okay, let's see here. <laughs> Christopher Aguilard, he's got him a little, got some boudin balls. He's here. We can start the meeting. Okay, Chairman, we're going to call to order. Uh, we need a uh, financial report and reading of the last minutes. Christopher, you'll do that while I'm talking. That'd be good. Doug Brown, what's the protein ratio of the Purina bass pellets to a bluegill? Example, one pellet equals how many bluegills? The protein ratio of Purina bass pellets. I think is 41% of which the majority of that is fish meal. Now it does have a little bit of plant protein but it's it's fish meal based protein. Now how that compares to a bluegill I don't I don't know how um, oh, I, oh okay here's here's an answer for you here's an answer for you when Mark Griffin invented that feed what he wanted to do is those Aquamax largemouth pellets are about as big as the end of your thumb they're like three quarters of an inch he designed those to where seven of those pellets is the same nutritional value as a 10 to 12 ounce rainbow trout. So there's your there's your pretty good answer. So I would say um, one pellet is probably the same nutrition to four or five three to four inch bluegills. That's going to be my guess. <laughs> to, uh, uh, those uh, those pellets, seven of them weigh around two ounces, and two ounces of nutrition is after you wring out the extract all the water from a 12 ounce or a 10 ounce rainbow trout, you've got about two ounces of of, of health, two ounces of nutrition. So there you go. I see I see your question. Okay, Cody Smith, Mr. Barrett said he may have mentioned to you what I'm doing when you were with him last week. Yeah, yeah, Cody, he did tell me that actually. So did Craig Upstrom. Craig Upstrom called me and told me about you. 
Um, let's see here. If you get a free day in the next couple of weeks, I'd love to meet up. If you want to come check the spread, just let me know. What I should do to contact you, just message me right here or send me an email at boblusk at outlook.com with your phone number and I'll call you. Devin Thompson, I know salt water isn't your field, but thought since it's caused by freshwater output, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what's happening in Tampa. Oh my freshwater output. I'm stumped about that because I don't know what's happening in Tampa. I haven't I haven't paid attention to Tampa. I don't have a TV in the RV and uh, even when I do have it, because you'll love this, we had grandkids a week ago Saturday night and I cannot find the remote to my TV. I've turned this RV upside down. I don't know if one of them swallowed it and passed it after he got home. I don't know what happened, but that or that, I'm going to have to get another one for a Samsung TV, if y'all know how to do that. Okay, so Devin, I don't know what's going on in Tampa. Okay, Kelly Duffy, I love Kelly. He's right, he's helping me out right here. So, Florida don't indirectly stimulate y'all. Ooh, that's a good point. I'm glad I didn't think about that when I was talking about that a while ago. So that's a good good point, Kelly. So Kelly, if you want, if you want to chime in on, uh, you know, I wonder if I can invite you in, Kelly. I wonder if I can invite you in here. Let's see. Kelly, I'd like to invite you to this to this show. Let me see if I can do it. Um, no, no, can't do it. I could probably figure out how to do it if you ask. Maybe hey Kelly, maybe you can ask to join the show. And you if you want if you want to, hell your hair may be dirty and you might have chocolate around your mouth. I don't know. So uh Mark Dobber, order, order a universal remote or look under the cushion. Hey, man, I have not only have I looked under the cushions, I unzipped the cushions and looked inside the liner. They were in a hide bed in an RV. I mean, I took that sucker apart, turned it upside down. I have looked in every cubby hole. I, I, what I think was one of the little turkeys put it in the trash and I threw it away. Didn't know it. It's what I think. Okay, large fish kill from the freshwater influx from storms or something thereabout. Okay. Okay, uh, let me see here. Large, okay, all the fish kills are happening inshore and nearshore. Some say it's from over fertile waters from the rivers. Okay, that could, that could be the, that could very well could be the case. Because when there's a lot of nutrients coming down, there's several areas like when, where the Mississippi dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. There's several really expansive dead zones where there's so much nutrient activity that it can't grow healthy stands of, of algae or plankton or rotifers or zooplankton and you know you wind up with some unhealthy situations so the fish kills that are going on or if it's if it's saltwater fish it's going to be because the freshwater diluted the salt water or it's bringing something in from point source pollution from agriculture or golf courses or the misuse overuse of fertilizers or and or herbicides etc so somebody's got to figure that out but i'm not attuned to it enough to be able to talk to you about it so christopher argular how's the progress on the new homecoming it's great we're finished with the demo it's cleaned up we've started to build inside and it's not a major renovation debbie uh, wanted to uh, she took out a wall between the kitchen and the living room. We put a beam up across it. And that's gonna be arched with, with uh, rock on both sides of it. Just, she likes rock. They're gonna re-rock the propane fireplaces, build new cabinets, new appliances, and an island in the middle of the kitchen so we can all sit around and in the kitchen and because that's our, really our focal point. You can look out the window there from the kitchen and see the river. So it's pretty cool. The swimming pool is about 20% completed which I've never had a swimming pool, so we're gonna have a swimming pool. Just gonna have an infinity look straight to the river. When 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 we get it done, I'll be sure and take a bunch of pictures and show you guys. So let's see here. Wyatt says, "Can you touch on treatment of American pond wheat? I know it's good for the pond, but it's pretty thick in the shallow fingers of the tank that I'd like to open up, and I stocked eight grass carp." Okay. Here's what I'm going to tell you about American pondweed. First of all, it's one of my favorites. That one and eelgrass, Ballisneria. Those are my two of my favorite uh, plants for ponds. Now you can you can treat American pondweed. You can use. There's a number of herbicides out there. 
If you want to go to aquaplant.edu, I believe it's, or dot, let's see, aquaplant.tamu.edu, I think, but just Google aquaplant, and it will take you to tell you your different options on how to deal with uh, bushy pondweed, American pondweed, in, in pretty much any any of the common plants. Now, here's what I'm going to tell you to caution you about it, is that when you've got pondweed growing in shallow water of a pond that's dropping, keep in mind that's nursery ground and it's also holding loose soils in place. So if you decide to take some of it out, you can certainly do that, but think about three or four steps beyond that treatment. I may need to move this around a little bit. Yep, I think so. <clears throat> My wife is fixing to come in the RV, and I know she's not going to want to be seen in the background. So, um, eight grass carp in that pond are, is probably going to be enough to manicure your American pondweed. So, but treating it, if you want to treat it, you got several options. You have a full pond treatment, or you've got a spot treatment. You know, or you can uh, just open up lanes with the spot treatment. That's the kind of things you can do with approved herbicides. You know, and Kelly can chime in on some of that. Hey, girlfriend, what are you doing there, kid? Huh? Did you go potty? Good girl. Yep, Debbie just looked at me like I lost my mind. So, uh, I'm just having, I'm talking to friends, honey. Sorry. Kelly Duffy wants to be in the video. Let's figure this out. Let's see if we can do it, Kelly. I just heading. This would be pretty fun, Kelly, if we could do it. Kelly, you may need to uh, you may need to click on it. I don't know, but we're we're trying to add Kelly in to the video and he and I'll have a conversation if we get him in, that'd be pretty fun. Okay, so in the meantime, while while I'm waiting on this Facebook to do what Facebook do, I'll uh, Jeremy's asking, how do you know the algae bloom? You judge it by the color. You know, now, it, now, that's for guys like me that have done it forever and ever and ever. I have judged plankton blooms, algae blooms, and I'm, going to, I'm not going to sit here and tell you I've done it right. But what I'm going to tell you is I look at the visibility of the water, and then I judge the color of the water. Now, as a, as a guy with, a training, with training in, in aquaculture, fish farming, and fish production, what I've learned is, Okay, Kelly is saying no answer from the live video guest. So it looks like I invited you and you needed to do something. I don't know. We might need to practice on that here before long because it would be really good to, uh, to be able to do that. So what early in the spring, when you get a good plankton bloom, it's, it's, it's a really bright green color. Then it begins to shift from a bright green to an olive green. And if you were to look at that under the microscope, you'd see green algae, but you'd also see zooplankton. You see little microscopic bugs scooting around on the slide under the microscope. So when he goes from, from a bright green to more of an olive green to an olive brown to a brownish olive, that when you get to that brownish olive color, that's when you know the zooplankton are about to outnumber and overeat the good, the good um, plant plankton, phytoplankton that you want. So <laughs> in late spring, that's usually when that happens. That's when we add just another dose of fertilizer to keep Keep that cycle going and allow those zooplankton to feed, which then feeds the small bugs and small fish and then on up the food chain. Now, when you when you look down in the water and you see what looks like little bitty green pencil lid, or you see chunks of a bright green um, pieces about as big around. I just got a I just got a phone call, so it said that, that it was paused for a minute. But you judge by the color of the water. Now, this time of year, if you've got a blue-green algae bloom, that stuff is producing, it's dying, it's floating, and it looks like spilled paint on top of the water. But if you look down in the water and you just look closely and kind of focus on the water, you can see little clods, tiny little clods, about as big around as a number two lead pencil, a number two pencil lead, just throughout the water column. Now, if you really want to get scientific, there's a couple of ways you can go. You can preserve a water sample 
and send it to a microbiologist. Uh, C-Pro even has a lab that where they'll do that for you. Now, they charge you for it. Or Bill Cody will do it up at Malento, Ohio. Now, you can find Bill Cody at pondboss.com on Ask the Boss. Now, what Bill is going to tell you to do is to get uh, uh, just a small bottle and get, you know, just say a, a pill bottle about that big. If you can seal that pill bottle and you fill it up two-thirds of the way with pond water and then put about four or five drops of betadine in it, the betadine will kill and preserve that algae. And then you send it to him second day and he'll get it for 35 or 40 bucks. He'll do an algae count and tell you how close to toxic your water is with blue, with blue green algae. Now, who knows another name for blue green algae? It's really not an algae. Blue green algae is not an algae. That's kind of a common misnomer, I guess you could say. Cyanobacteria, that's right. That's it. Frank James is joining in. Christopher Aguilar is frying some Toledo Ben Crappie. You know what? I'm not jealous all the time, but I am part of the time. Uh, what's an indicator that the water is safe or unsafe? You know, i tell you this. I would rather you err on the side of caution. So here's how I would consider it unsafe. If you stick your sitchy disc in the water, here's what I was going to tell you a while ago. I forgot to say this, but <clears throat> but if you will uh, check, the, check the visibility in the morning and then check it in the afternoon, because what tends to happen is cyanobacteria tends to migrate higher in the water column as the day goes on so it can get more sunlight. So that means the visibility decreases late in the afternoon. So you check your visibility. If your visibility in, in, in the morning is like 18 inches, and then you check it again in, uh, at 6 o'clock in the evening or, or right at dark, you know, 8 o'clock, and you check that visibility and it's down to 6 inches, then your density may be enough to where it's toxic. And if it's got a bright green look, another thing that Jeremy was, t was telling me about his spawn today in his message is it has an odor. It will have kind of a musty odor. Now, Jeremy's in his six acre lake, he's got one diffuser. That's not enough. I think, and, and I'm, not, I'm not scolding Jeremy here, but what I am going to do is tell everybody that's listening to this if you're going to get an aeration system, get one sized for your pond. Work with one of the companies. Go to the Pond Boss Resource Guide. <clears throat> Look it up there. You know, we got several of them uh, that are outstanding company. Every one of those companies will design an aeration system specifically for your lake. And you want to be able to turn that thing over about one and a half times every other day. At least that much. Now, you don't want to turn it over too much. You don't want to turn it over three times a day because then you're messing with the temperature too much. You know, but if you're not moving enough water with aeration, then you're not breaking up the thermocline. If you're not breaking up the thermocline, you're regurgitating toxic water into the water column around that diffuser, and you can be causing more harm than good, which could help uh, create problems rather than alleviate problems. So there's my spin on uh, talking about blue-green algae for the moment. I'm going to take a minute and do a commercial. I do, I do always want to thank, I didn't get to do this last week, but I want to thank Texas Hunter Mag uh, Texas Hunter Products, Great Fish Feeders, um, Deer Blinds, uh, Ground Feeders. They've got some really good products. Not only are their products good, their customer service is great. I can order a feeder before 2 o'clock on a weekday, and it's shipped out that day. You know, so it, there's, there's no delay with their customer service. And every once in a while when something goes wrong, a battery finally gives up the ghost or whatever, They'll send one that day, they're, and they're very, very responsive to emails and phone calls. Uh, Purina Mills, been working with Purina Mills since 1995. We've had a good, strong, uh, compassionate relationship back and forth, and they've done what they need to do to create some of the best products that we could possibly have to make our fish grow bigger. I mean, you, you've already seen a couple of testimonies tonight about what that fish food's helping people do by growing bigger fish faster. So I'm a huge fan because I know how they, I know they're, how their research and development works. I've been to the manufacturing plants, you know, their distribution sometimes, we got to talk, you know, but I love those guys and they make great fish foods. 
also want to thank Greg Grimes, Aquatic Environmental Services from over in Georgia for helping sponsor this show. And uh, Greg, you know, he's been a longtime friend. And actually, I love him. I love to hear the story because while he was in college studying fisheries in Georgia, at the University of Georgia, they took Pond Boss there at the library, I guess. And he, he got Pond Boss and read every issue cover to cover. So he knew when he was in college, he wanted to make a living in the pond management business. And he's he's made a big impact on this industry. David Schneiderman, also Easy Docs, he's a sponsor. And if you guys know other folks that want to sponsor the program, it doesn't cost that much. You know, we just want to help cover some of the airtime and cover a little bit of uh, some of the hidden costs, because we do have hidden costs. Mark Dyer, what's the proper process of water sampling, the where's, when's, and why's, and is that process different if you're trying to test for something else like cyanobacteria? That's a great question. Frank James, take note of what what Boudin Man said. He's right. He's keeping me in line. He noticed. Okay, so Mark, I'm going to answer your question. Frank, I'm going to drop down to yours about fertilization. Uh, what's the proper process of water sampling? And, and I tell you, this is really, I mean, that's a good question because it depends on which lab or who, you, who you're sending the sample to. Everybody's got different protocols. I love to use the uh, soil sciences lab down at Texas A&M or the aquaculture diagnostic lab down at Texas A&M University. Each one of those labs has their own protocol. Uh, Todd Sink may want five gallons of water depending on what he's testing. If he's going to be testing for, um, uh, things like turbidity and what you can do to clear up muddy water, then he's going to want a big volume of it so he can do some testing in bigger jars and figure out if you need gypsum, alum, whatever, whatever you need and extrapolate about how much you need. But the other lab, uh, the soil sciences lab, they're looking mostly at well water for irrigation. So I like to use that lab sometimes so I can check pH, alkalinity, some of the heavy metals and different minerals. You know, Bill Cody, he's going to tell you something different because he's going to be looking for algae counts. So if you were just to send him a bottle of water by the time it got there in two days, the algae would be dead and it would be decomposed and he couldn't identify it. So you got to preserve that algae before you send it to him. And I presume the C-Pro Lab is probably the same way. So when you're getting ready to sample water, here's the advice I'm going to give you. Decide why you want to sample it. Are you trying to build a baseline to where you can have something to compare to when you have a problem, then you're going to want, oh, I th oh, Debbie just, I thought she found the remote. No, she didn't. <laughs> so uh, you, you're going to have a purpose for, for why you're going to send a water sample in. Then you pick the right lab so you get the results that you're looking for or the, the analysis that you're looking for. And then if they want to preserve the, uh, the whatever's in the water, they'll tell you. They'll let you know. Like, there's no lab on the planet that's going to check oxygen because by the time it got there, it's it's totally changed, you know? So it depends on the lab. And so, yes, that process is different if we're trying to test for something like cyanobacteria. Now, testing for cyanobacteria, it's, it's cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, actually is common. You very likely have it in your pond right now. It's very likely. The problem comes when it can outcompete the other algae and then dominate and the percentages go up. Because the way cyanobacteria works is it's got toxins inside its cellular structure. And once it reaches a certain density and then it dies and the cells rupture, that's when it gives off the toxins that can kill fish, it can kill dogs, you know, it can, it can even kill other animals. Say hello to everybody. Come on, give me kisses. All right. Look right there. You're on TV. All right. Go play. Go lay down. And so when it comes to cyanobacteria, you're thinking about uh, how dense it is. So when you're sending this, the samples to guys like Bill Cody, for example, he's going to give you a cellular count per milliliter of water or whatever unit he's going to choose, he's going to tell you how many hundreds, thousands, ten thousands, or hundred thousands of cells you've got in that unit of water. And once you see that, once he tells you what the density is, he's also going to let you know whether that's toxic or not. You know, so 
part of the mitigation plan to deal with cyanobacteria is to uh, identify the density of it. And then when it's, if you're, if you're monitoring and if you, if you see that you've got a problem with that bright green color and you have it tested and you're right on the cusp of having too much, then you can follow that up with the treatment of it with an algae side and take out some of that. And you can also add some beneficial bacteria and Kelly Duffy can, can expound on this better than I can. They can help, can help expedite the breakdown of, of those dead algae cells. So what typically happens, and then there's a product like Foslock, which is lanthanum with bentonite, that when you put it in the water, the lanthanum, which is a basic element, extracts the phosphorus, binds it, and then permanently sequesters it in the pond mud. So one of the brand names of that product is Foslock, P-H-O-S-L-O-C-K. Now, if you've got a cyanobacteria blue-green algae problem now, Foslock won't fix it because that phosphorus is tied up in living plants. It can't extract it from living plants. So when people are trying to, like the city of Austin right now, they're going to go in with, a, with an algaecide treatment followed up with a Foslock treatment, and they're spending seven figures to do it. Whereas if they'd have done it before the cyanobacteria started to grow, they would have saved some dollars, you know? And so you, and, 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 the, and ask the boss in this issue of the magazine with Warren Blesch's question, Matt Rail talks about it in detail and gives a great protocol. If, if you've got blue green algae, you need, you need the July, August edition of Pond Boss magazine. Despite the bullet, call the office, subscribe, even if you only buy that issue for seven ninety five or whatever it sells for, yeah, yeah, seven ninety five. Hell, that's enough to save your pond if you've got blue green algae. But the but the basic protocol is to take out some of the blue greens, not all of it. If the density is too high and you kill too much and it decomposes too fast, you killed fish. So you need to be working with a pro. I I, I don't I wouldn't look at this as a do it yourself project unless you're really well schooled in how cyanobacteria works, how to read the test results, how to judge your bloom. If you understand the density analysis, if you understand all that, then go for it. You know, but most people don't. So, uh, and heck, you know, it took me a long time to begin to learn about it myself. And, and I, I'm in the business, you know. So uh, uh, it's a matter of killing some of it and then extracting the phosphorus from the water and sequestering it in the bottom. Now, the upcoming article in Pond Boss talks about how to use plants as a filtration system with pond water or lake water to extract as much phosphorus as possible. And the, the article, I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of a sneak peek into it. Uh, there's a professor at Clemson who used floating islands and sequestered 3.4 pounds of phosphorus and 40 tons of plants harvested from a 100 by 100 foot floating island. Now, that doesn't sound like much phosphorus, but four pounds of phosphorus can grow way over 500 pounds of algae. You know, so it doesn't take a lot of phosphorus to grow a whole lot of plants. That's a big reason blue-green algae can get out of hand, because that phosphorus is fuel. So by uh, taking out some of the cyanobacteria with an algae side, Follow that up with a Foslock treatment. And I know Matt Rail has talked about using alum sometimes to sequester phosphorus and, and sequester it on the, put it on the bottom of a pond. There's, there's tools now in the pond management business that uh, can do that. But it all starts with, first of all, knowing that you got blue-green algae. And secondly, how much do you have? What's the density? And then should you do something about it? Now, I'm going to tell you this. In most... And most recreational fishing ponds in the majority of the United States, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to qualify that here in a minute, blue-green algae is typically temporary. It doesn't last that long. Now, in ag states like Iowa, uh, Illinois, uh, parts of Michigan, um, parts of Minnesota, uh, eastern Dakotas, where you've got lots, especially corn, soybeans and ag land where they use heavy amounts of fertilizer 
your blue-green blue algae incidences are going to be much higher than they are in other areas of the plant, like where we live in Texas. So that's that's that's. I'm going to leave it right there for now and see what kind of questions we got. Um, Frank James noticed you advised folks to add some fertilizer to the main pond channel, avoided weedy, shallow areas. Can I do the same now? Four feet of visibility, but I don't want to beat the bushy poppy. Yes, you can. <coughs> yes, you can. You sure can, Frank. Now, here's the thing. You be sure and read on the label how much fertilizer you need and start off with a half dose. Because if you've got four feet of visibility and you uh, fertilize the main body of the lake, you don't need to put more than about two or three pounds of fertilizer. Let's see, depending on the kind you're using, you know, read the label, follow the label. That's what I'm going to tell you. If it takes, if it's saying four pounds per surface acre of water, use half that. Use two pounds and be sure you get it mixed well within the water column. But use the volume of fertilizer to fertilize the whole lake. So what, what, I'm, what I tell people is be very, very cautious fertilizing this time of year. Because if you overdo it, you can't undo it. So if you want to get the visibility from four feet down to about two feet, do it, but fertilize the main body of the lake with the full, the full amount, which is a half dose. Get it dissolved in the water column. You'll initiate that plankton bloom, and it will spread through the rest of the pond or the lake. Just be real careful. Now, if you if you look and you see your visibility is low, and you've got blue green algae, don't fertilize. Earl Conway checking in from New Mexico. Got a leaky pond in the Texas Panhandle. How would I go about trying to find local clay materials? Earl, I tell you what I do is I try to find if there's a leaky pond on a ranch and you're you're in the Panhandle, you're in the Canadian River watershed, coming off the cap, down in the valley, and that's all dispersible soil. So what I'm going to tell you in the Panhandle is see if there's any nearby Playa Lakes. If you can find a Playa Lake, odds are high that Playa Lake is sitting in a, in a clay pit. You know, the, and Playa Lakes, uh, I, just, I helped a guy design a lake south of uh, Floyd Data, northeast of Lubbock, and we found a Playa Lake that was about a quarter of a mile away. Now, he had to pay a pretty good chunk to haul that clay down to, to line the basin of his lake down in the valley below the cap, down in that, in that down below the, um, the canyon in the White River Basin, where it's where he was, then you... I would be looking up on top and look for Playa Lakes. And if, if you can find even some moderate clay, then you can mix that with bentonite or ESS-13 or soil flock. So one of the amendments, you can use some of those amendments with clay if it's marginal clay. But go up on top above where that leaky pond is. Christopher Aguilar, let's see what Christopher's got. I thought you were cooking. So we've had rain literally every day for the last month here. How does that affect the pond water? It destabilizes it, but it makes it pretty much um, autonomous. Let me let me put it this way: that water is constantly changing. It get used to it gets used to constantly changing, but then when it quits raining, that's when you start to see the consequences. When it tries to restabilize, that's when you start seeing blue green algae. That's when you start seeing heavy plankton growth, that's when you start seeing things, you know, where uh, explosive filamentous algae, even in the summertime, you'll see explosive growth of pond weed. So when the rain quits and the water settles, then whatever is going to happen will be a consequence beyond that. Uh, that's, a, that was kind of double speak. Let me, let me make it this way. When it quits raining and the water settles down, then there'll be a response. As it's raining, there's not going to be much of a response because the pond doesn't know what to do. The plants don't know what to do. It ain't like this mug. By the way, 35 bucks a year, folks. Pond Boss Magazine. Here it is. Cheaper than a Friday night day. Debbie and I are getting ready to go to dinner here in about 15 minutes, and I guarantee you, we're going to spend more than that on dinner tonight. Uh, hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. In the comments section, if you haven't done that yet, click like, share this to your timeline, and you're eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss hat. 
any phone bus mug say it with me Aguilard while you're cooking crappie and tapping on your phone it knows how to keep hot things hot cold things cold we don't know how it knows but it knows all right so Jonathan Stoddard said we stocked about 12 to 15 6 to 8 inch hybrid trout bass in a one acre 6 to 15 foot deep East Texas pond early in the year since snowmageddon we haven't caught one yet don't really see any signs of them do you think they would have survived the freeze yes i do i think they would have survived the freeze but i tell you what happens if you stock six to eight inch hybrid stripers fit 12 to 15 of those in a one acre pond you're probably not going to see them until they're about two pounds now if you're feeding keep feeding because odds are they're going to figure out that fish feeder even if you're you know three months in or four months in just be faithful and they will reward you. Uh, they can't typically, um, they can't, they don't typically come to the feeders until they get a little bit bigger. You know, they tend to feed on forage fish and when they do eat fish food, they're eating it as it goes down through the water column. So don't give up on them yet. Don't stop more. Give them a little bit more time. In the heat of the summer, you're not as likely to catch them as you will be when they're, when it's cooler. Here's Leanne Holtzbauer from Nebraska. I haven't seen her in a while. Our aerator with three diffusers runs in our two-acre farm pond from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. Is that long enough to benefit the pond? Trying to avoid the heat during the dog days of summer. Also, when the temp rises to the 90s, do we keep feeding the fish? Uh, yes, keep feeding the fish. And i tell you what I would do, Leanne. Buy a thermometer if you don't have one. Check the water temperatures. Go off the end of the dock and check the temperature all the way top to bottom. If your aeration system is doing its job, you're going to have an autonomous temperature top to bottom. As long as that temperature is below 83 degrees, you're fine. Uh, another thing you can do is you can actually kick it on at 9 p.m. and let it run until 9 a.m. and probably keep that temperature down low. So that would add another, what's that, two, four, that add another four hours of aeration. Uh, and and that, i tell you how I would decide that. If you check the temperatures from top to bottom and they vary, if they're warmer at the surface than they are at the bottom, change your timer from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Clint Benbow from North Carolina. Good to see him. Enjoying the live videos. There's Danny Mac. See Danny Mac checking in. Trevor, is 30 million, 30 parts per million alkaline if you high enough to fertilize no 40 is preferable, but 30 will still work. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. You just got to be a little bit more particular. You may not need quite as much fertilizer, uh, but this time of year, be picky, be picky, check your visibility, you know, and, and let me tell you this, there's, there's two reasons to fertilize a pond. One is to minimize sunlight penetration to the bottom of the pond to keep aquatic plants from growing wild. Well, if your visibility is high now, your plants are probably already wild. Chances of you fertilizing and reducing them not that high. Uh, the second reason is to feed newly hatched bait fish. The majority of your fish have already spawned, so you don't necessarily need that food chain. You know, so be picky about why you fertilize. It's this time of year. Travis was feeding the fish. David Shatterman feeding MVP to bluegill four times daily. They sit around waiting for the feeder to go off and eat like crazy. Do I run the risk? Of creating a society of dependent bluegill that are unable to go find a meal on their own. <laughs> oh, I love politics. <laughs> Stay in my lane. Seriously, how do you know when to increase frequency and or duration of feeding? All right, here's what I'm going to tell you. If those fish will clean up that fish food within about a minute to a minute and a half, feed it to them. Now, typically what happens when you reach a certain, okay, babe, I'll see you in a minute. I'll be at the restaurant. Are you taking her or leaving her here? Leave her here. Okay. I don't think you'd take her to the restaurant. Sure look good. Ooh. Distracted me. Shut the door, honey. So, uh, where was I? She sure looks good. Woo. Um, oh, feeding fish. <laughs> feeding fish. So, um, now, typically in the summer, once you reach a certain density level, feeding levels off. Now, keep in mind, you've got a dynamic population going on because you've got predator fish. Uh, and, 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 and 
David, met, I don't know if you've stocked your bass or not, but David just got through building a new pond, probably three acres. So I'm going to presume that that's the pond we're talking about and that you've stocked your predator fish, stocked the bass. Well, the bluegill is going to go crazy eating that fish food until their density level reaches a certain point and their numbers begin to go down as the bass prey on them. Then your feeding is going to drop. Now, their metabolism rate slows down when the water gets hot. So when that happens, just watch how they eat. If, if, if you're feeding four times a day and they're cleaning it up on all four feedings, keep going. But if there, at some point there's going to be one of those feedings where they're not going to eat nearly as much, cut that feeding back. And if you want to increase the time on the other three, then you can. Uh, but if you just watch the fish, the fish will tell you when they're full and when they've had enough. You know, and uh, it, uh, people get worried some about overfeeding. But I'll tell you what overfeeding really is. If you're feeding a one acre pond, a bag of fish food every three days, you're overfeeding. Nobody's gonna do that. I would tell you to feed a pound and a half to two pounds per feeder per day. And if you've got, you know, if you're, if you're feeding half a pound per setting, you're not feeding but two pounds a day and the fish are eating it up, rock and roll. Let's see here. Robert Dyer can feed him one cup of Aquamax MVP twice a day in a three and a half acre pond cost some antibacteria, algae bloom, and an old sand pit along the Platte River. Absolutely not. That can't cause it. Uh, there's not enough phosphorus in that fish food, even if it was uneaten, to create a cyanobacteria bloom. If there's a if there's a cyanobacteria blue green algae bloom in that gravel pit pond along the Platte River in Nebraska, then there's another reason for it. I've never had this issue prior to this year. It has been present for at least five weeks. I have been feeding the last two summers. Now, I'll tell you this, it isn't gonna cause it, but it can, it can contribute to the longevity of a blue-green algae bloom. Now, it, you know, in all my years of being in the fisheries business, I have seen cyanobacteria blooms caused by overfeeding fish on fish farms and it creates uh, bad taste in the fish you know and those fish get rejected so those those guys learn how to manage that but that much feed in a three and a half acre pond one cup of aquamax is probably less than a pound so a pound of aquamax mvp a day over half of that is going to be turned into fish flesh. You know, one one pound, three, 12 ounces, that's going to turn into meat, which leaves, what, four or five ounces of fish waste. That's not enough to make a difference. The label is the law. Counselor Christopher Aguilard. Travis, I'm going to send a water sample in. With your thoughts on a three-quarter acre pond. Full is full. pH 9, ammonia 1 part per million, nitrogen 0 parts per million, phosphorus 0, new pond, no fish. I'm going to tell you that that, that ammonia count is wrong. It, it's not likely going to be that high. If it was that high, it would be burning the gills of the fish. So I would, um, I would send an email to the... Uh, uh, Aquatics Diagnostic Lab at Texas A&M to Dr. Todd Sink and tell him that. And then he will tell you what to do to preserve a sample. So if you do have that much ammonia, you need to do something about it. It needs to be denitrified because ammonia is unstable. Ammonia is one of the, um, basically one of the waste products of fish. But if it's measurable in water, then there's something else going on because ammonia denitrifies fairly quickly, which means nitrite to nitrate. So it breaks down pretty pretty quick. All right, let's see what Danny Mac says. A $20 inline heating thermostat from Amazon, my air temperature set point is 90. If the air temperature is lower, it runs until it sees the air temperature of 90. Mine cuts off rarely, but if it ever stops raining, Okay, so what Danny's talking about is he's got an inline thermometer that that uh, he's got a smart aeration system. And Danny, Danny's a genius. This guy's a nuclear physicist, I'm telling you. He, 
this dude knows what he's got. He knows what's going on. So I keep trying to get him to market that thing. And one of these days we'll have a conversation about it over a, over a glass of tea. Jeff Wallen, they're making a mess in my pond eating the cattails at water level. Then they float around and moss grows on them. Uh, you know, <laughs> Jeff, you kind of opened me up there a little bit. Uh, I, got, I got a call yesterday from John Vick. Uh, who's a client up in Bland, Missouri, he got about a 30 acre lake up there. And he just returned from a trip and there was a dead deer floating in his pond and he could smell it in his lake. So he went out there, he knew something was dead, he just didn't know what it was. And there was that dead deer, this is pretty gross, but I'm gonna tell you anyway, covered in maggots. So he and his running buddy put a rope around it, towed it way back up in a cove. And uh, when he came back, his bluegill were in line feeding on those high protein maggots so uh when you said when you said that when i read that deer making a mess in my pond eating cattails at water level and then they float around and moss grows them i didn't know that deer would float around in a pond and moss would grow on okay well i know there's no what you meant so uh you know i i know a lot of guys that would be happy to have deer grazing down there in cattails you know, especially if they're controlling them enough. Now, I've never watched deer eat cattails. I've watched beaver pull them up and clip them off and let them float over the pump. But I've had several people tell me that they've watched deer eat those cattails. Now, with the moss growing on them, I don't think that's a big deal because that's actually, in, in a very minute way, that's really helpful for your water quality. You know, and so that's... Uh, that's a, uh, I'm laughing at Danny Max response. Yeah, T, LOL, yeah, water. Well, there's John Wilson, good to see John. John, I'd love to catch up with you one of these days. Sounds like business is really going great. So, uh, yeah, I'd like, let's catch up one of these days. Frank James, beavers love cat. Yeah, you know, I have watched a number of lakes where beavers will cut down cattails, munch on them, and actually go, put them into their lodge or a dam where they're building them. I went and looked at the lake site in Oklahoma last Saturday, and beavers were doing that, saying that thing, making a lodge in the bottom of a creek. They were stacking everything they could get, from willow limbs to cottonwood limbs to little chunks of cattails. So they'll do that. All right, y'all. We've been almost an hour now. Uh, we've, we've hit blue-green algae pretty hard. Uh I know it's a boring topic, but it's an important topic. And if it's a concern of yours, uh, call guys like John Wilson, Aquadoc. John is Aquadoc. Uh, he's in the Midwest. He deals with blue-green algae all the time. So you can friend him on Facebook. He will take you to Aquadoc. Uh, there's a bunch of different – if you go to the Palm Boss Resource Guide at palmboss.com, click on the Resource Guide, then you'll find it. Also, I want to remind everybody about the Bob Lust Institute of Higher Pondology. If you're thinking about building a lake or you want to learn a lot more about lake management, fisheries management, plant management, we've got six different modules at six different prices. Or you can buy all of them for 425 bucks. Now, that might sound a little high, but I'm going to tell you this. It will save you the dumb tax. I promise you. you from what you learn off of that curriculum, it will save you way beyond 425 bucks and money that you would not spend in ways that you just don't know you shouldn't do. You know, so go to pondboss.teachable.com or you can go to pondboss.com and it says Institute, one of the horizontal menus. You have Ask the Boss, you've got this, this Facebook page, we've got a lot of free articles, a lot of stuff, but the Institute is full of premium content. So I'm going to wrap it up and uh, look forward to seeing you guys. And we had a great time with, with Miss America last week. We didn't leave their house until 930. They were so much fun and intelligent and asking great questions. And we spent quite a bit of time online looking at maps and topography and all kinds of cool stuff. So I'm going to go join Debbie and the grandkids for a little bit of uh, late evening supper right here at Pecan Plantation at the 19th hole. So. Until next week, next Wednesday, I appreciate you guys watching. Adios.